and welcome to the Manchester Culture Bunker. Do subscribe, press that button. Now, this is more about the late, great Tony Wilson and the tribute radio show that I did back in 2007. A raw, unedited interview, this time with Bob Dickinson. He was one of the producers on the original So It Goes uh, Granada TV programme. Worked at Granada, worked on Radio 4, has been very involved in all the art side of things in Manchester and encouraged and inspired by the late, great Tony Wilson. And indeed, started off as a keyboard player in magazine with the offshoot band with Howard DeVoto from uh, Buzzcocks back in the day in 1977. So this is Bob Dickinson talking unedited about the late, great Tony Wilson. I'm Bob Dickinson. I used to uh, work with Tony Wilson at Granada TV in the 1980s. Uh, I used to be a producer on programmes like So It Goes, and uh, I now work at the BBC for Radio 4. <laughs> very, very middle-aged. <laughs> now, Bob, what, when did you first uh, become aware of Tony Wilson? Because you, you're not a Mancunian. I mean, no. you just explained that. Well, my, pretend my question's not in there. I'd see Tony uh, presenting So It Goes on Granada because we lived, as a teenager, I lived in Congleton, places like Congleton and Sandbach in South Cheshire. And uh, so... It, when I was at home, before I went away to, to, to university, I was aware of the sort of beginnings of punk because Tony used to, I mean, I saw the Sex Pistols on, on So It Goes and that was a real turning point. But being, you know, even before that, he was presenting really interesting bands in a, in a way that was not like the way bands were presented on the BBC, on The Whistle Test, for instance. He had a sort of irreverence about his style. He was funny. He was, uh, you know, he was, he was, he was obviously a good journalist as well as a as a as a good presenter, and uh, he had this sort of style that that everybody admired. Um, then, when I graduated in seventy seven, I was in Norwich, which was like in the middle of nowhere. You couldn't see there was no punk bands in Norwich. Uh, I'd seen the White Riot tour in uh, a, a, the West London Pavilion, which is near Great Yarmouth. And that was the only real sort of punk that I'd seen. So I had to go somewhere where it was happening. So I went to live in Manchester and I worked on a magazine called the New Manchester Review, which was a fortnightly events magazine, which didn't pay contributors, but it got you into print. And Tony also wrote for the review. And I first met him when I went to their Christmas party, I think in 77, December 77. And he turned up to the Christmas, it was a Christmas lunch actually in a Greek cafe. And he turned up with his researcher, Andy Harris, who's now a big comedy executive in ITV. And I was just really impressed that he, tur he actually turned up. I was bothered to take an interest in the review, but he did. He, did. he was genuinely involved in anything that was uh, new and saying something different in Manchester. He was genuinely interested in it. And uh, later on, uh, when the review went bust, I started writing for a fanzine called City Fun, which had offices above the, f or below the, sh the Falls re rehearsal rooms in Higher Broughton, Salford. And we continued to take a, you know, a, a, an interest in, uh, well, we were obviously absolutely obsessed with factory records. We had very, very kind of mixed feelings about factory, but which by this time, by 1980, was an established sort of dominating force in Manchester music. And we did, you know, we, 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 we did a very long interview, I remember, with Tony in a pub. Uh, and he gave us, you know, a whole afternoon of his time. He was, always ever, he was always very generous with his time. He had mixed, you could get on the wrong side of him. I mean, I was between, I think in the late, late 78, I was also promoting a club night called Tingle Tangle with some mates of mine. And we did it all completely DIY. And we got a space, a really gr great space, which is an Italian basement cafe in Back Piccadilly. And we booked for our first gig, Echo and the Bun Bunnymen, their first Manchester appearance. I think it was probably one of their first appearances outside Liverpool. And completely DIY. And we, right down to printing, designing our own posters, which were done on a screen printing press, which I had discovered in my cellar. It, my, it belonged to our landlord. And uh, so we pr I remember we fly posted these posters all, uh, ourselves as well. And I can remember distinctly fly posting the whole of the buildings opposite this, this building, the BBC on Oxford Road, which were derelicts at that time. You know, everything was, t was going bust. 
And the whole place was, was a, a fly posting site. And I remember fly posting that building in broad daylight. Anyway, the whole of Manchester was covered in our posters. And I got a call at the New Manchester Review from Granada. And somebody said, it was somebody from the Granada Reports newsroom saying, can you come down to Granada this week, this lunchtime? Because Tony wants to talk to you. So I thought, oh, wow, Tony's actually taking notice of our gig or something. So we went, I went down to Granada reception and Tony met me. And he said, you don't put your own posters up. You don't fly post your own posters. You, put, you, you pay Tosh Ryan 21 quid to put your posters up or else. And there were a few swear words thrown in. Get out. So I went and I thought I'd really blown it with Tony um, because at that time Tosh ran the fly posting operation and you, you, you still do have to pay somebody to fly post around Manchester. It's illegal to do it. So you pay somebody to do it for you. And at that time, Tosh was the person. But we always refused to use Tosh. And we never paid Tosh, or as much as I like Tosh, you know. Uh, so, um, so, so I thought I'd blown it with Tony. But actually, on the night of the gig, he had Echo and the Bunny Men in on Granada Reports playing to plug the gig. So he was... And we got it completely sold out. You know, it was it was the place was absolutely rammed with people, and it was a major success. And we had, but we had to leave the venue because we got raided by the police, and they discovered some heroin or something in the toilets. But to, so Tony was could be very nasty in a f humorous way, but he could, be, but he was also incredibly generous, and I always got on with him when I was at Granada later on. Uh, and you you ended up uh, producing him on the uh, other side of midnight, didn't you? Yeah, for a short while. Uh, it was just before I left to go to the BBC, but um, the other side of midnight was it was interesting because he was like really, uh, you, I I would do things like organise the features and the interviews and book the band, but he would he would just go his own way. He wrote, obviously wrote his own scripts and he was very good at writing scripts, but if he didn't approve of the music, he'd say so in the script. You know, I remember we booked Courtney Pine, and Tony wrote into his script this great long rant about British jazz and Island Records were funding this supposed renaissance in British jazz, and it, which is all, all a fiction and it's not really happening. It's not a natural, a real phenomenon because Tony was always completely keyed into uh, real popular culture phenomena. He, was, he had a sort of sixth sense for it. That's why he was hip to punk when he was really a hippie because he was the hippie generation of 68. But he knew punk was important, and he was. That's why he was clued in to Manchester and all, all that whole dance floor thing when it took off at the Hacienda. He was. He he knew that when there was a, a a buzz going around or some kind of phenomenon going on with teenagers and young people, that was the that was the thing to get into, and it was really interesting because the other day I've just been making a program for Radio Four about fanzines, and I went to John Moore's University where they've got an archive uh, which was left there by John Savage. Uh, it's all punk fanzines and memorabilia that he accumulated when he was writing that book, England's Dreaming. So he was, went back to this archive because he's, he's going to write another book about, of punk interviews, and he was going through his archive. And we came across this letter that was Tony wrote to Malcolm McLaren after the pistols were on So It Goes, and it's a typewritten letter with like little bits of Tipex correction on it. And at the end of it, Tony's going on about Keats, the poet Keats, the romantic poet. You know, this is, this is very Tony, you know, because he, he, he's Cambridge educated, you know. So he knew his English poets. And he was saying to Ma Malcolm, you know, Keats said that the artist is not really a free person. He's like an Aeolian harp, which is a, an ancient Greek musical instrument that was played by the wind whistling across its... Uh, its strings and it would just make its own weird music that was driven by the wind. And he said, uh, Keats, you know, qu Tony's quoting Keats as saying that the poet or the, the, the real artist is someone who, j who just allows the strings of their own talent to be driven by whatever's going on around them, the zeitgeist, you know, the, the, the natural phenomena that are happening in culture. And so Tony was saying that that's what punk was about. It wasn't about a Svengali like McLaren. It was about being tuned into 
the zeitgeist, which is a horrible word, but that's the closest to what I think he meant. Um, so every, and I think that's really interesting because Tony was like that. He was always clued into what was going on around him. And a lot of people say he was actually hypnotized by McLaren and badly influenced by McLaren. McLaren had a bad effect on him. I, I don't believe that. I think he, he saw through McLaren and I think he, I don't think he was on bad terms with him, but I think he, Tony went his own way and he had very, very strong feelings about the way popular culture worked. Uh, and and they were based around this idea of of, of tu being tuned in to, to to the way people were were reacting to, to things. Is there any way uh, that you feel that in some ways your your own media career is down to seeing Tony Wilson on So It Goes? Um, yeah, I think so. I think pro I think we all owe. A gr I owe, yeah, I do owe a, a debt of gratitude to Tony because he re he. I remember on the review. The New Manchester Review, that uh, the fortnightly uh, that I worked for, he rang up the editors to say that he liked a pe one of the first pieces about music that I wrote, which was a piece about a, uh, a Moss Side reggae sound system that I'd got to be sort of friends with because I was DJing down at Rafters and I got to know a lot of these other DJs. And Tony liked this piece and I thought, wow, he actually does read this magazine and he, he liked what I've written and I thought that you know that gave me a huge boost and of confidence and you know later on when I, when I was at Granada and I was booking bands for for TV shows we we uh, I always kept in touch with him about what Factory was doing and we booked quite a few you know Factory bands because I genuinely liked them and his taste in music and the and the the aesthetic the Factory kind of aesthetic had a huge influence on on loads of us so even though there were things about it that I thought were a bit a bit suspect in the early days, you know, the um, the Nazi imagery on the first Joy Division EP. Although I loved that EP and I loved Joy Division, but I always had mixed feelings about that. Well, that's Tosh Ryan's thing, isn't it? Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, I know. Mind you, having said that, I had mixed feelings about the fact that he signed up a, a classical roster and a folk yeah. rock band and a one-man band when it was supposed to be Manchester. <laughs> I know, yeah. Well, I don't know how that was. Oh, God, how did they get all that off the ground? How did they finance it? He was he was it. lagging a bit at the time, Tony. Yeah. I don't think he'd been in his own club for about six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what did you think about the films, the, the, in particular the Joy Division, the two Joy Division films, Terry? What do you think? I ended up enjoying 24-hour party people. I didn't like it the first time I saw it, but now I, I quite got into it. Uh, Control, I've still not seen. Mm. You know, so, but that, that, that was that was another thing I was going to say uh, um, about Tony. You know, ju just to comment on the fact that really, in the space of thirty years, we've gone from you know a punk band like the Buzzcocks and a couple of those scruffy kids like Slaughter and the Dogs and that to like two Hollywood movies made about a short period of time in Manchester. I mean, how do you think that's come about? Well, that is largely down to Tony because Tony. Oh, Sorry, yeah, the two, the, the two films, the two feature films that have come out about Manchester music, 24-Hour Party People and Control, are very much to do with Tony, Tony Wilson's, first of all, his, his mythologising of what happened to Manchester music. Because, and that's what 24-Hour Party People is. It's, it's Tony's version of events. Uh, and Control is the biography film about Ian Curtis of Joy Division, which also features, well, both films feature uh, a dramatised version of Tony Wilson as a character. I think it's very interesting because Tony, according to Lindsay, his first wife, Tony always used to say that you should live your life as if it's a movie. And that movie is 24 Hour Party People. That's the, the way Tony lived his life, I think. And that's the myth, that's the myth that he invented about himself. And it's no coincidence that the version of Tony in that film is a is a self-deprecating character who's not afraid to make an idiot of himself. And there's actual shots of him on Granada Reports doing hang gliding. Um, and and the Steve Coogan version of him is it's quite close to the way Tony was in the in the buffoon version of himself. I mean, I can remember doing a piece on Granada Reports with Tony, for instance, where we went to Ch Chester Zoo. Chester Zoo which were beginning to... Uh, had introduced this idea of um, sponsoring the animals. So you paid them some money and you'd get your name on a little uh, plaque 
on the cage or on the tank or whatever it was. And I met Tony at the Chester Zoo and I said, it's dead easy, you've just got to interview this representative from the zoo and then I'd like you to come to the insect house. And he went completely white and, I, and he said, what, you, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, we'd really like you to handle a tarantula spider. <laughs> Tony said, I just don't do spiders, I'm really scared of spiders, please don't make me do it. But we made him do it and he was completely freaking out. And he was great because he did it and he, did, he knew that that would get a laugh. The fact that he was obviously visibly terrified of this huge thing crawling up his arm. He didn't get bitten or anything. Um, and that was what the 24 hour party people version of Tony was, was very good at getting across. Um, the other film, Control, the, the actor, who I can't remember, I'm afraid, who plays Tony, is very different. And yet you know that it's endorsed by the real Tony because Tony was producer on that film. So he must have wanted this other version of himself to be portrayed. And still it's not a serious, a serious portrayal at all. At one point in Control, they're all signing uh, the, their, their loyalty to Factory in blood and Tony is, collapses from blood loss or, or shock or something in the corner. I don't believe that really ever happened, but it's, it's a... I mean, it may have happened, but it's it, it, it's obviously Tony having a laugh as, at his own expense. I think that's quite healthy, really. Although people have enormous uh, problems, some people have enormous problems with the way that those stories are told. Um, I think Tony's role was really absolutely crucial, and it adds to the mythology about Manchester. And what will happen is that that mythology will just continue. And t Tony must have known that. Someone else will make films about Manchester music, other periods of Manchester music, I'm sure. Um, but, Tony, you know, Tony just did what he believed in. And so we can't really blame him for the way those films turned out. It's an absolutely amazingly uh, important fact that they were made in the first place, I think. Unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, finally, I was going to say, do you think Tony's going to end up uh, a bit like John Peel, whereby you can't really... Uh, there's about 35 people they've tried to use to replace what one man did. Do you think that's going to be the case now with Tony? It's going to take 35 or 40 people to do or have the, the effect, you know, on the sort of music, music business that Tony had? I think a lot of those people are, are, are already there, you know, in place. They're not necessarily having an impact on the music industry because the music industry isn't what it was in 1977 or 78. It's in, it's in complete turmoil now. <clears throat> Nobody, I don't know if there's one person who can actually make something happen in Manchester musically uh, to have that kind of impact that Tony had. I'm not sure one person could do it. I think there are, however, there's this infrastructure another word I don't really like very much, but it's it, of people in the media and in music industry, and, and it's all here in Manchester and, you know, in broadcasting and in TV, uh, people like you and me, that we, we, we're all here, partly because Tony paved the way for us to be here. And I think the fact that Manchester's got the confidence, the energy to do what it does and to continue to do what it, what it does and to, for instance, to attract the BBC to Salford, I think that's got a lot to do with Tony as well. The, 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 that, that, his, his place in media history is that, you know, he, he paved the way for all sorts of us to get into the media and to do what we've done. And I'm very grateful to him. Yeah.